Don't make a yet, Dick. Oh, I gotta be a good grip first. Yeah, get a grip on yourself. Yeah. Okay, Cam the camera's rolling and Carrie, you're ready with the slate? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you you can give that stuff to Carrie now. Yeah. All right, I'm fairly tight on collarbone, so you can go all the way out to where he is. Okay. <coughs> B roll take 10, Dick Stratton. Oh, sorry, guys. Did Great. you get that? Yeah. All right, Dick. Uh, we're going to be seeing Mike McGrath in Colorado. And there were no photographs that came out, to the best of my knowledge, of the rope um, uh, techniques used by the Vietnamese. But Mike meticulously drew this. Can you talk about this book? about? experience with it, about maybe anything you know about Mike? Well, Mike McGrath was one of the boat school boys. He was a Naval Academy graduate, and I did not know him in prison. I met him when I was stationed at the Naval Academy. Uh, Admiral Bill Lawrence was the superintendent. He also was a had been a prisoner of war, and he collected a group of us that were unwanted and unwashed around uh, 1978, 79, and bought us into the academy. Mike McGrath was one of those, and he was in the leadership department. Uh, one of the interesting things about, many interesting things about Mike was that he was uh, a self-taught artist, uh, specializing from what I saw in line drawings. And he had a very accurate memory of uh, any detail. This was not just in prison, was uh, artistically inclined that way. The beauty to us was he had the ability to put on paper uh, pictures of the torture sequence, pictures of a couple of different types of cells, a picture of us in our living conditions. Uh, he had one picture in his book, uh, Prisoner of War, uh, showing a guy in his cell holding on to his, his broken wrists next to his half quart of teapot of water, the ration for the day, and, and a rat sitting there looking at him. Uh, it, it was so realistic, you could just automatically put yourself in that position either sitting on the next bunk or being that actual person. And then uh, as far as documenting the various stages of the application of uh, the stress torture, the ropes, uh, we called them. I, back in history, it's called El Strapado and uh, other deviations like that. But it's essentially the same thing, disjointing your arms and hanging you from hooks in the ceiling. Uh, but he was able to recreate that in real time after his return. In fact, a, a book uh, that I mentioned, Prisoner of War, was published shortly after I returned because he captured those pictures for his debrief in real time so they would understand what we were talking about in our debrief. Uh, Oh my goodness, yes. We were, the, the Wallo prison uh, was really uh, Maison Centrale, and it was the central prison for the French in North Vietnam, and uh, processed most of their leaders through there. In fact, there was a revolt in the Communist Party in 1969 and 1970, and while we were there, they were processing uh, high-level Vietnamese communists that they were trying to uh, take power from, they were rotating them through the same program we were in. Uh, we didn't get to meet any of them, unfortunately. It would have been interesting. But uh, every picture in here uh, brings back a memory about something. But the, the rope trick goes back to the Middle Ages as far as documentation. I'm sure it was used uh, much before then. But as far as being uh, 
documented in the English language. That's the first time I've come across it. But he has the, uh, the position of the ropes across the elbow. I still have scars today across my elbows uh, where the ropes were, and he has them placed here in his drawing in exactly the same position that left the scars. He has the manacles that held our wrists. Some people describe them as handcuffs, and they're not. They're manacles that are gear-driven. Uh, the key is an Allen head screw, and it grinds down uh, and pinches your flesh right through to the bone, uh, which uh, gets infected, uh, is extremely uncomfortable, and, uh, and it also leaves long-term marks. He has the position of uh, where they guard needed to take a break for uh, smoke. They used to take and strap your wrists together, put long leg irons and shackles on your feet, and then bend you down and tie your hands on the shackles just to leave you in a stress position while they were having a smoke. Um, there's one here that uh, Mike puts that reminds me of Tag Stockdale when they were going to make him give a public appearance. He refused, and so they forcibly shaved him. And Mike has a picture of a Vietnamese guard shaving an American prisoner who's in his striped pajamas, which usually uh, was the prison dress uniform, which is an indication that this guy was probably going to be marched off to be displayed in front of some visiting firemen. Um, he has pictures of solitary confinement um, showing uh, the facial expression of, uh, of, of loneliness and darkness. And one, one picture particularly I, I find to be uh, kind of funny was the counterband. They'd come in and shake down your cell every two or three days. Anything they didn't issue from you, you would take. So uh, you would use and make uh, dice out of bread so you could uh, have a crap game or something like that. And as long as you could keep the rats from eating the uh, dice, it was a nifty thing to have. We'd, probably most of the Christians made themselves a crucifix, and he has it uh, there. Any sharp instrument we would keep using as a writing tool, he has one of those there. He has a piece of the toilet paper, which we used to write on, since it couldn't be used for toilet purposes, and a collection of string, uh, needles that we made out of fishbone. Anytime we could find a fishbone, we'd manufacture our own needles. And all of that, of course, was counterband. And then he has another picture of us doing the five BX, the Canadian five basic exercises at one time it was the preferred mandated military exercise. And Tag Stockdale insisted that we keep ourselves in shape so we could participate in our rescue when they came to rescue us. So he had us doing push-ups and sit-ups, uh, running in place. He wanted to make sure that uh, if somebody came in to uh, rescue us, that they would not have to carry us, that we'd be able to take care of ourselves, and they could protect themselves and protect us. Uh, particularly lovely one people think is rather ugly is an, an open latrine, and uh, uh, people did their, their defecated by squatting. There was no toilet bowl as such, and usually there were two foot pads and a hole in the top of the cesspool where you did your business. Uh, people say, well, why have a picture of that? Actually, that was uh, male central. Uh, in most of the camps, they would only send two guys around to collect the waste buckets with the manure and have them empty them in the latrine. So we learned to make boats out of cigarette paper uh, wrappers or uh, once again, the so-called toilet paper, and we'd float notes out on top of our manure, and the guys would take all these buckets and they'd swap notes around, delivering them in the empty buckets back to other cells, and then there were always 
holes around in the cement and we'd stuff notes in there for people that we couldn't reach with buckets. So it, it was post office central and people would look at that and say, well, how disgusting, it's just a toilet. And I'd say, no, that was a very useful place for us. And that was the marvelous part about uh, Mike's intelligence to, to see and retain this information and realize the value that it would be in later years. In fact, Mike is our uh, official uh, non-POW, Vietnam POW historian, and has written a whole series, probably coming up on 100 now, of what he calls Max Facts. And he'll take something like the riot in room seven, and he describes that and who was in the room and identifies where they are today, which was an interesting room because we have presidential candidates and senators and congressmen and uh, state officials and teachers and professors, all kinds of people. That was their second career after they returned from, uh, from Vietnam. It was a very successful training ground for future leaders in America. And uh, another one of solitary that I like is he has a guy sitting there in his striped pajamas. It had to be winter because you put on every piece of clothing you had to stay warm and kind of dark. And there's a guy just sitting there with his hands in his lap on the floor. And you can't quite see his eyes, but you can just look at that picture and you say, there is one lonely guy. And he just captures that in that picture. Then he has a, to help people out, he has a picture of uh, how we adapted the American uh, deaf spelling code. I forget the politically correct word for deafness now, but uh, we had our adaptation because we had to try and help it, uh, teach it by repetition, by showing. We couldn't explain it to you. We just had to start out by repeating, showing it to you, and we tried to make each each hand sign looked like the letter it was representing. A C looked like a C, an E looked like an E, and uh, a Q uh, shooting the bird. Everybody knows 4Q, and so that was very easily transmitted. But he, he shows that, which a lot of people didn't realize that we were able to do that. Uh, another one that I love is he shows the guy in where I probably spent most of my uh, spare time, and that was a lookout for guards while somebody else was communicating. Um, you would end up on your knees not praying, but looking out underneath the door, you couldn't, there were no windows you could look out. The Judas hole was a, a block. You couldn't see through the, the bars on that. So you had to look at the crack underneath the door to look for a guard's feet approaching to send a warning sign to stop the tapping. So you spent probably easily, well, I know, you spent two hours a day with your beak down there, stuck under looking for somebody's smelly feet. So that's very evocative. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information on, on each page. And the nice part about it in the drawing the book is set up so that on one page, uh, on one side, the right-hand page is the line drawing. And then with a great uh, economy of words on the left-hand side, he's describing what you're looking at. And that, that makes the book a very useful tool for passing information. What is this book about and why it's so popular? Uh, eventually, it turned around that they ran out of them and uh, they didn't want to do a reprint, a reprint. And we finally had to demonstrate to the Naval Institute proceedings that owned the copyright that there was a demand for this book and that they should reprint it. And uh, my original copy, I think one of the boys has it, but the only copy I have now is one of the reprints. And it's not bound quite as nicely as the original is but it still is a most effective uh, teaching tool. And anyone who's interested about the Vietnam experience, they don't have to read a thousand foot tome, pardon me, a thousand page tome to learn about it. They can take Mike's book, go through it, and in less than a hundred pages, 
they would have a great insight. And he really helps at the end by giving you an idea of the camp regulations. When we came home and told our story, uh, the press, of course, immediately went to Jane Fonda, the world's authority in all things, and asked her about torture and Americans. And she went back to the Vietnamese and said, what about this? What, you know, what do I tell them? And the Vietnamese gave him the party line is that we were severely punished for disobeying camp regulations. And she said that they deserved it. They got exactly what they deserved. They disobeyed the rules of the camp and they were punished. Well, the rules of the camp said you'll betray your country, you'll betray your squadron, you'll give them all the information you'll ask for, you'll betray your fellow prisoners. Those are the rules of the camp. And to give you that insight in the background of the rules you were living under, Mike spells them out at the back of the book in an appendix, which makes it all the more that valuable. So Mike McGrath is living in Colorado Springs these days is extremely active in prisoner of war uh, material, particularly identifying uh, wannabes, phony POWs. A lot of people don't realize that we have more, uh, prison, twice as many prisoners of war uh, here in the United States than were released by the Vietnamese. Why anyone would want to pretend to be a prisoner of war beats me. Why wouldn't you want to be a Medal of Honor winner or something like that? But uh, they're clogging uh, the system. They're making us all look like fools. In fact, Mike went to the VA and told them that they had four phonies on their pension list that he uh, and others had identified. And the VA told him to mind his own business that records were private in the VA. They weren't even the least bit interested. So. Uh, Mike is out there fighting for us and still trying. Even today. That's fantastic. Okay, all we need to do is an over the shoulder of you paging through the book and 